Hello, everybody, and good morning, and welcome to our Nursing Home Without Walls Implementation Support Webinar Series. So if you're new to the community, my name is Stephanie, and I will be your host today. Um, just a bit of housekeeping before we get going. Today's discussions will be in English, mostly, um, but you can ask your questions and have dialogue in English or French. Um, we're pleased to offer simultaneous interpretations provided by Boost events for this session. So at the bottom of your screen, there is an interpretation button and you can click on that and um, decide which language you'd like to hear the discussions in or just remain as is if you care to listen to the discussion in both languages. If you need any support throughout the webinar, you can reach out to one of our producers using the chat feature and our producers today are Nat and Kirsten. And we invite you to share your questions and comments at any point um, using the chat box or raising your hand. And again, you can do that in English and French and we will happily translate. Next slide, please. So before we get started, I would like to acknowledge that we are meeting on land that has been inhabited by Indigenous peoples since the beginning. And in particular, today, we are acknowledging that we are broadcasting this webinar from Ottawa, Ontario, which is the traditional and unceded territory of the Anishinaabe Algonquin Nation. We recognize their historic connection to this land and this place, and we are deeply grateful to gather here today. Next slide, please. So we've got a full webinar today um, talking about safety, equity, cultural safety. Um, and so to, to lead our discussions in these rich topic areas, um, we have three of my colleagues from Healthcare Excellence Canada. We have Anne, Brady, and Katie, who will each take their turns um, sharing with you their knowledge in this area and uh, leaving a space for us to have a discussion on these very important concepts and how they might relate to the work that you are doing today. Next slide, please. So since it's a full webinar, I'm going to stop there and I'm going to hand it off to my uh, lovely presenters to take you through today's discussions. Thanks, Stephanie. Just maybe looking for a thumbs up that you can hear me okay. Thanks. Um, I believe I'm taking over this slide to get us started today. Uh, as Stephanie said, hi and big warm virtual welcome to everyone. Um, we are all excited to be here today. Um, my name is Brady. Um, I have the privilege of joining virtually today, of course, from the traditional lands of the Anishinaabe Algonquin people and territory in a place colonially known as Ottawa. Um, and I work as a senior program lead on the patient safety, equity and engagement team at Healthcare Excellence Canada. Before we wanted to dive into the content today, we wanted to try and start off in a good way and share some ideas about how you can be present today in a way that really works for you. And so for some, we invite you to please share your ideas and questions in the chat as they pop up in your mind. So that could be throughout the session. And I think we have some time at the end as well if you wanna jump off mic and ask questions live. We wanted to note that it's okay to have your camera and mic on or off during today's session. Um, it's really up to your preference and what you're comfortable with. And we invite each of you to um, have humility, compassion, and self-compassion for yourself and others today, as we might be exploring topics that are new to you or ones that you might be intimately familiar with, and that we are all at different places in our learning journey related to patient safety, equity, and cultural safety. And finally, if you find that at any point you need to pause and reflect, connect with those who bring you joy. For me, it's my little dog, Chester. Um, I would grab him if he was close to me. I don't know where he is right now. Um, or perhaps that means writing down or journaling your reflections, um, whether that's during or after the session. We just encourage you to do the things that you need to reconnect with yourself. Next slide, please. We also want to give you all some prompts to help guide your participation today. Um, the questions I have here on the screen have been adapted with approval from Dr. Ed Connors and Dr. Stephanie Nixon from past sessions we have done at HEC. 
So as uh, Anne, Katie, and I are, are sharing some information and content with you today, we invite each of you to, um, maybe it's jotting this down to think through what ideas are coming to mind for you. How are you feeling about what is being shared? And are there any learnings that you might want to try in your practice or perhaps you're currently doing and maybe would like to share with everyone after? Great. Next slide. And I think it's over to Anne. So it is. Thanks, Brady. I'm absolutely delighted to join you today to discuss um, HEC's approach to patient safety and encourage all of you to find ways, whether they're big or small, to champion safer care for all. My name is Anne McLaren, and I'm a senior program lead at Healthcare Excellence Canada. And I sit on the same team as Brady, the patient safety, equity, and engagement team. And I'm joining you today from my home office in Prince Edward Island, which is also known as the traditional and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq First Nation. I have been working in the patient safety space uh, for over 20 years, and it is a topic that I am very passionate about. And so it gives me a great pleasure to be able to be here today to share a little bit of my passion with you. I have a bit of a tall task. I'm trying to condense 20 years of experience into a 12 minute presentation. So I think Brady's uh, suggestion of writing some reflections on a notepad uh, will be very helpful. You'll find throughout my presentation, I ask you lots of questions and ask you to reflect on several things. Normally I'd love to pull you in and engage you in the conversation, but we'll save that for a day where we have some more time. So next slide, please. So to really begin, I want our discussion on patient safety to start with grounding you in our why, why we should make patient safety a priority every day. And at Healthcare Excellence Canada, and I'm sure in your practice as well, you, be you believe that everyone deserves safe and high quality healthcare. Next slide. But unfortunately, we know this is not always the case. The next slide, please. What our harm data is telling us, and even though this is old data from 2004, we still use this um, to help uh, as a benchmark for our hospitalized patients. And what this study told us is that 7.5% of our hospitalized patients experience an adverse event. And of those adverse events, um, about 37% of them were judged to be preventable. And so this translates into approximately 10 to 20,000 deaths each year, just in our Canadian hospitals. Next slide. And I don't want you to think for just one second that the issue of unintended harm is isolated to just hospitals. We know that this is an issue and a concern across all sectors of care. For example, our, st our study um, and safety at home um, that was done in 2013 revealed that 13% of home care clients experienced unintended harm while receiving care. Next slide. And despite the fact that the, these studies are old, we know the data is still relevant. And unfortunately, what our more recent studies are telling us is not only that we've not improved, but our harm data is telling us is that we are getting worse. And on the screen here are a couple of quotes from, from some of our leaders in North America uh, in the safety world. And what you can see, quoting them, our lack of progress is disturbing. Next slide. So I'm gonna shift gears away from looking at our harm data. And I want you to pause and think and reflect on this question. How safe is our care? How safe is the care that you and your colleagues deliver? So this is the first opportunity to pull out your notebook and write a few thoughts. If I'd have more time, this is where I'd ask you to raise your hand and engage in the conversation with me. But um, 
Rather, what I invite you to do, um, as I said, use use your notebook to write your reflections, or if you feel comfortable, feel free to jot some of your ideas in the chat box. But to answer the question from my perspective, um, what I can tell you that in Canada, and really globally for that matter, is that we don't have a good way of answering this question about how safe our care is. In Canada, and like most other countries and other healthcare organizations, we have attempted to answer the question, how safe is our care, by measuring how much harm is in our system, which we're learning is very different than answering the question of how safe is our care. Next slide. Does the absence of harm mean that we are safe? So another opportunity to write some reflex, reflections in your notebook. What I can tell you is that the work we've been doing in the last you know, 10 years or so is really um, focusing on this, this concept that the absence of harm is not the same as the presence of safety. And focusing heavily on harm and harm prevention is not leading us to the improvement in safety that we're all striving for. Next slide. So another way to uh, look at the same concept is another question. And so I'd like you to ask yourself, if measuring harm is really in a good indicator of how safe our care is, or is it simply an indication of how lucky we've been? Prior to joining Healthcare Excellence Canada, I worked um, for Health PEI in the Quality Safety Department, and part of my job was reviewing incident reports, and I would have hundreds of reports to review on a monthly basis. And quite often when I would look at some of those incident reports, I would say to myself, man, we were lucky, that was a close call, or how has this not been uh, addressed or identified earlier? So this concept of luck definitely crossed my desk many, many times in the space of working in quality and safety. So if we could jump to the next slide. And so working in the safety space for 20 years, I can say with, with such a heavy focus on measuring harm, and let's, you know, that has been such a heavy focus of how we've approached safety is measuring harm, analyzing harm, trying to improve harm it has really tipped the scales towards safety strategies that have focused primarily on preventing harm. And a lot of these strategies have very much been a hierarchical approach. And so on this slide, you'll see many of those strategies um, and I'm sure they will resonate with you. So things like um, policies, rules, guidelines, toolkits and checklists, um, projects and more projects and committees and more committee work. Um, maybe even conversations around, well, the quality safety department is taking care of that. I don't need to worry about it. And so although we know that the initiatives and strategies on, on the slide are really important elements to safe care, what we are learning is that they are obviously not enough to help move the mark on safety. This hierarchical and harm-focused approach that's on this slide, as you can see, is off balance and it's not been successful in achieving safer care for all. Next slide. And so furthermore, we're really beginning to recognize that not only have these harm prevention approaches to safety um, not been successful. They've also been contributing to a workforce that feels discouraged, overworked, and lacking psychological safety. And once again, I want you to think and reflect, you know, is this how you feel? Is this how your colleagues feel? Does, does this slide really resonate with you? And think about when things do go wrong in your work, what's your typical approach? Do you layer in more policies, add more rules, point the finger on those that don't follow those rules? And another question to think about, are these rules 
and the initiatives and strategies that you're you're adding in, are they helping or are they really a distraction from your efforts to keep staff and clients safe? Next slide. So essentially my slides up to this point um, have really been pointing to this concept that our history is teaching us that we need to do things differently. Next slide. And so what this means is to improve patient safety, we're asking you to start thinking and actioning safety differently. And to help you on this journey, we have released a document called Rethinking Patient Safety. And I believe the team circulated the link to this document to you um, ahead of today's presentation. This discussion guide is on our available, and it is really intended to help spark discussion on safety. And it's designed for all potential audiences, really as that starting point for rethinking safety. Next slide. And so what's on this slide now are some kind of big picture elements on how we hope that this new thinking on safety can help bring balance to our scale, our safety scale. So starting today, I want you to not only think about preventing harm, but also think about ways and things that you can do to start to create safety. And so some of the ways that you can do this is by adding curiosity, inquiry, and reflection into your daily practice in hopes that this can help balance that need for assurance and accountability. I want you to think about ways that you can start to place value on the intelligence that you gather through listening, observing, and perceiving, and balance that out with the safety metrics that you're collecting. And also I want you to think about moving safety away from always thinking of it as a project, something that needs to be done and start viewing it as a way of thinking, acting and responding in real time. And finally, what I, you know, our big hope, our real big goal is to start moving safety away from a rear view mirror approach. And when I say that, I mean, looking at safety after a harm incident has happened. And I want you to shift that and switch that to a, an approach that is more proactive and really inclusive of your client's voice. Next slide. And so I know that was a lot on the screen and it's not something that you can probably very easily jump into. But what I want to emphasize is that there are some things that you can do right away. And I want you to think about some of those small things that you can start with and that you can incorporate into your daily work. Next slide. And so that one thing is the practice of inquiry and, and reflection. And this does take practice and that's why I say a practice of inquiry. And so with the curious mindset, I challenge you to start having conversations about safety with your leaders, your colleagues, your partners around the table, and also your clients. And you can start by asking questions like, like I asked you today, how safe is our care? Are we just, are we safe or are we just lucky? And what can we do right now to make our care safer? And I also would like to challenge you to start having those conversations with your clients and their care partners. And so they can start to feel like a valued and important contributor to safer care. And so some of the questions you could ask your clients would be, what makes you feel safe? And what would make you feel safer? So the next few slides, if you wanna just quickly flip through them, not going to go through these, um, but they are just here as resources for you, um, and they're intended to be conversation starters to help you with starting those conversations in your practice of inquiry. And so with that, uh, there is a quote on the screen from Albert Einstein, the world as we have created it is a process of our thinking. It cannot be changed without changing our thinking. So with that, Brady, I'm going to turn things over to you. Thanks, Anne. 
um, for that. I always, I always enjoy listening to you um, present on rethinking patient safety, and I've heard it a few times, and I think I learn something new each time. Um, I think I want to start with just acknowledging we are sharing some big ideas today. So again, be kind to yourself as you are introduced to these new concepts or perhaps they're very familiar concepts. Um, and it's just acknowledging the wealth of information. Today I've been tasked um, to speak about equity oriented approaches to care, or as I think I will talk about it today um, as health equity. And before diving into uh, my high level presentation, I did wanna take a moment just to thank and recognize the communities and particular, particularly those with lived experiences of structural and systemic inequities, people of the global majority, black feminist scholars like Kimberly Crenshaw and Bell Hooks for being the creators and originators of many of the ideas um, and theories I might be introducing today as part of a conversation on health equity. And I see my role really as a facilitator to the work that has come from community-driven and grassroots activism and justice movements. Next slide, please. And so I'll thank Anne again, because you started us off with, a, I think, a really great strong a strong point around patient safety and specifically um, use the words and from I believe the HEC strategy as well that everyone deserves safe and high quality health care. I think this is a really good segue into a conversation about health equity and later cultural safety um, and noted here the first bullet I have on the slide is a quote I actually pulled from a BMJ publication that actually was articulating this clear linkage between patient safety and health inequities. And I think importantly, what this article, and I can send this around as a resource, um, was really pointing to was the recognition that there is an opportunity here um, that through rethinking patient safety, we can begin reducing health inequities. However, as we started with today, yes, we must rethink our approach to safety, but to platform this opportunity for an equitable health system, we also need to understand what are the root causes of health inequities? Why do some people, why do some communities have drastically different experiences of health and health outcomes? I think it's also quite important as we get started today that we approach the discussions around health equity with careful thought, humility, and with an acknowledgement of its complexity. I say this not just because there is no one size fits all approach or one model we can take to be equitable, but rather really to challenge us to acknowledge this complexity and I think embrace it for what it is to help open ourselves to different ways of doing, shifting habits of mind and practice, but also so, so that we can really set ourselves up to listen to those with lived and living experiences who are navigating the systems every day in different ways. Next slide. So I wanted to start off um, with a bit of storytelling to get into health equity. And to do that, I, I'm gonna share some pictures that recently came from um, a coming together of brilliant thinkers from coast to coast with different lived experiences and perspectives of navigating and working the health system as a patient, community member, staff, social worker, physician. We had a great group of, of I think, over 37 people um, to have a conversation about how do we enable health equity in practical and meaningful ways um, in what is now colonially called Canada. And we did have an artist come who drew some of these pictures that are on the screen that you see now in the coming few slides. And so as we pose this question about how do we enable health equity in, in good and meaningful ways, a lot of great ideas were shared. And I think the first that really stood out to me was that health equity is often about compassion and connecting with ourselves and people. I like this as a place to start as for me and, and maybe for many of you, it might mean thinking back to your why. Why have you come to work in healthcare? What drove many of us to wanna dedicate our time, our energy and care to this field? 
And I think going back to those roots in ourselves is a really good place to start thinking about this, um, uh, to start thinking about health equity. Compassion is one of these things, one of these practices um, that we can do, and it doesn't take up a lot of time and that there is countless evidence, resources, evidence, and lived experiences that speak to the fact that compassion leads to less errors, more positive experiences of care, and improved patient safety. And this can also be applied not just to the practice of care itself, but also to how we have self-compassion for ourselves. So giving us grace to learn, make mistakes, and do better, as I think that's widely a human experience of learning and experiential knowledge. And so maybe just to wrap up this slide, I really want to start here because I think it's important for us to collectively understand our individual relationships to health equity and how important it is to be reflective of who we are as people and our instincts to want to care for, for people, patients, clients, each other in good ways. Next slide, please. And so just continuing on this, this story of the folks we brought together, um, we asked for hopes and fears related to health equity. And um, there's a lot of excitement in the room for the potential of, of an equitable health system. If you can see the image in the corner of the slide, um, you might note that some of the words that I will now speak to. Collectively, there was hope that the health system could think big and challenge what has been considered normal simply because that is how it has always been done, or that we can come together as those accessing and working in the health system to embrace challenges with grace and humility together. So again, embracing these challenges. And that equity is a place for life to bloom. And there is structural and systemic integrity to sustain a health system that meets the needs of people for years to come. Next slide, please. However, I think there is also an acknowledgement that to tap into this potential, it requires close attention and self-reflection, as there were some fears that people shared with us about health equity, such as that we will let our assumptions drive our practice. We hesitate and stall, even though we might know that there's a better way, but we just might not know how to get there that misinformation and disinformation will spread and impact quality and safety of care, and that we will forget about those in rural and remote areas. Next slide, please. I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation that to understand health equity, that we need to first get to the root causes of inequities. And so I think I was just sharing a bit of the excitement around where we can go as it relates to creating a more equitable health system and some of the fears that people have about um, where we're at currently. Now I wanna get into a bit of the why and the how many health inequities exist today. So leading up to this session, I, I believe a short 10 minute video resource was sent. Um, no worries if you didn't get a chance to watch because I'm gonna walk through it um, at a high level now. Just click the next slide button, thank you. In the video, if you had a chance to watch it, it was of Dr. Stephanie Nixon who developed the COIN model um, and really this model of a COIN to help us understand what is our relationship to systems of inequities um, and how can we actually disrupt oppressive, oppressive systems to achieve health equity. Stephanie describes this coin through the model up in that top corner. And so the top side of the coin represents privilege um, and it's tied to things like who we are, the social group we belong to, where we were born, what is our gender, education we might've had access to, um, the amount of money we have. Whereas on the flip side of the coin or the bottom of the coin is uh, referred to as oppression. And these are the experiences of disadvantage for the very same reasons as others experience privilege. And there are these factors often beyond our control and are just a matter of because of who we are, where we're born, what we might look like um, and things like that. And what's interesting and I think important about this model um, is the experiences of privilege and oppression often are working together to maintain systems of inequity, which I'll talk about in a, sec a second. 
And what Dr. Nixon is really challenging us to think about is this relationship between the two. Because oftentimes with health equity or equity initiatives, we focus solely on helping those are, who are experiencing oppression while treating the top side of the coin as somehow neutral. So those are privileged as neutral. And so I reflect on that, reflect on that point as I, as I move forward here. And if you could just click the mouse. Thanks. And so now I wanna walk through what do we mean by systems of inequity? So shown in the circle through the outer ring here, which is an image that we have produced here at Healthcare Excellence Canada, um, you can see the different forms of what I've been referring to as oppression. So these are things like colonialism, racism, cisgenderism, sexism, ableism, the list goes on. And what's important is that these forms of oppressioning, oppression are happening all around us and often infiltrating our ways of existing and our ways of thinking in ways that are complex and complicated. If you could just click the most, please. And so you might've noticed um, after the outer ring, we have these three layers and you can think of this as the areas in which uh, systems of oppression are operating. I'm gonna walk through them now and try to provide some examples. So we have institutional, which is the first layer. And this refers to the systemic and structural mechanisms that are in place, which sustain inequities. So these are policies, actual built infrastructure, laws, and our practices. One example can be used here is structural determinants of health, um, such as you know, geographic disparities. And we know that very often, if you live in an urban um, or a rural or remote area, that there are extreme differences in how you have access to vital care services. And that communities who are often not in urban centers that so live in rural and remote areas do not have access to the same health service and infrastructure. And this can this often and does result in many different health inequities and is an example of an institutional and structural barrier. Interpersonal refers in this case um, to the ways that individual perpetuate some of these inequities and discrimination through interactions, which is often influenced by unconscious biases, stereotypes, and different social conditioning. And I think in the context of healthcare, this affects relationships that we have with colleagues, as well as how we interact with patients and clients. And in this case, unconscious biases can actually lead to help how assumptions are made about patients based on race, gender, socioeconomic status, or other factors. And that these biases can lead to misdiagnosis or even delayed diagnosis. And that has a cascading effect on patient safety, quality, and overall health outcomes. Finally, there is internalized. And really what this is talking about is how these intersecting systems of oppression have been held on to us and really by our physical bodies and the role we each have to understand the ways that it affects us as people and also how we might maintain the systems without doing that self-reflective work of understanding why and how we are affected. And so mental health can be impacted and chronic stress, which we know has an impact on physical health. We're learning more and more about at least. So I think now that I've explained the nuances of how these systems operate, I wanna go back to the point around the top point of the, that, the top side of that coin as being neutral. And really this is an important part of health equity work as we need to understand how power and privilege play out in healthcare. These pieces around understanding our relationship to these systems is quite key. And part of that is also understanding that we have, you know, we have been born into these systems kind of like a fish in water we don't always realize it and that this is actually the biggest challenge and obstacle to learning as we need to unlearn and relearn what have been taught and been always considered as the normal. Next slide. And so with that, um, lots of, that was a lot of, you know, big thinking ideas. Um, so I just wanted to share a few places to get started. Um, and one really good approach I always say is reflexivity. And this really means asking yourself about what influences how you engage with patients, caregivers and communities. Think about who you are, what are your belief systems, what matters to you, what fulfills you. And this is, can be a great exercise to highlight the strengths you bring to your work. But it's also a great way to start thinking about what are some of those unconscious biases that we hold about the world and those around us. 
and how can we begin to unpack uh, this in our daily interactions. It's important to stay curious and ask questions as this is a great way to learn and relearn. We often talk about shifting habits of mind, um, or at least I do, and this is really just about thinking about those typical ways of acting and doing. And I will preface, that's not an easy task, but over time, small changes can make a huge different difference. And finally, a really good starting point is using a trauma-informed approach. And when I reference this, I'm speaking about understanding how these systems of oppression, so what I walked to walk through in that previous slide, are impacting people and acknowledge this truth and reality to nurture relationships with those we're caring for and those we see every day. Next slide, please. Thank you. Okay, I'm gonna wrap up here. And um, the reason you're currently seeing the Healthcare Excellence Canada strategy on this screen is I wanted to articulate uh, an important piece here as we transition to cultural safety. And so in the HEC strategy, we have identified culturally safe and equitable care in First Nations Inuit Métis priorities as part of our key quality and safety perspectives to guide the development and implementation of our work. And in recognition of the historical relationship between Canada and First Nations and UMAT, which is grounded in treaty, constitutional and ethical obligations, we understand the importance of maintaining distinct stream of work that's dedicated to reconciliation, while also recognizing that there are parallels and intersections between cultural safety and equity work. And so my colleague Katie is gonna come up now and speak a lot more about cultural safety um, and reconciliation, but I just wanted to use that as a transition of the importance of the distinct streams of work, at least how we've structured it here at HEC. Thank you so much. Katie, over to you. Thanks, Brady. It's a great setup uh, to move into uh, talking about cultural safety now. Uh, so my name is Katie Gasparelli, and I'm a Senior Program Lead here at Healthcare Excellence Canada. Um, I am, uh, my role is on the Northern and Indigenous Health Team, and so working uh, to support the organization internally as we look at embedding those two quality and safety perspectives across our work. And so I'll, I'll just start off by talking about cultural safety and where the term has come from. Um, so it's a term that's been around for about 25 years now. Uh, it was originally conceptualized by a Maori nurse in New Zealand. And really it's a term that relates to indigenous people. Um, it's been confused with other terms such as cultural awareness or cultural competency. And I'll explain how it's different as we explore the topic. But first, I just want to dig into why this concept of cultural safety is so important to people like you who are working in the healthcare system. I'll go to the next slide. So in 2015, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission finished their seven year journey and published the report describing the experience of children, families and communities as a result of the Indian residential school system that operated in Canada for about 150 years. So the report included 10 principles for reconciliation and 94 calls to action that speak to all sectors in Canadian society today. And so you might ask yourself, what does the Indian residential school system have to do with healthcare and how we deliver healthcare today? But there are actually seven calls that are specific to the health sector. And I've pulled one of these uh, calls to action to highlight for you today. But before uh, we explore that call to action, I wanted to flag the term Aboriginal. Um, so when the TRC report was published in 2015, the term Aboriginal was commonly used and accepted as the appropriate term. Since that time, there's been a bit of sh a shift in terminology. Uh, so the shift is to be as specific as you can, given the, concept, the context that you're talking about or that you're working in. So now we often use um, the First Nations, Inuit, and Métis to acknowledge that there are these three distinct groups of people. Also recognizing that there are many different communities and nations within these three larger groups. The term Indigenous can be used when we're referring to all three of these groups, for instance. Um, it might be appropriate when we're referring to a mixed group of urban Indigenous folks. Um, and the term Aboriginal can be found in Canadian legislation. Uh, as well as the term Indian. So it is acceptable to use those terms when you're quoting or referencing such items. 
So it's a lot, it's just around terminology and it, it is um, language and terminology in this area as it's a learning area of work does tend to evolve. So don't let it in, intimidate you, um, but just learn as you work through it. So this call to action is one of the seven that is specific to health and it is it states, um, we call upon the federal, provincial, territorial, and Aboriginal governments to acknowledge that the current state of Aboriginal health in Canada is a direct result of previous Canadian government policies, including residential schools, and to recognize and implement the healthcare rights of Aboriginal people as identified in international law, constitutional law, and under the treaties. And so this call to action really asks us to reflect on how we position the health challenges facing First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people today. The health system and providers have often been painting Indigenous people as the problem, when in fact, as Brady outlined, it's the systems and processes that we've created in our world that have been contributing to this um, poor state of health today. These systems like the education system, the residential school system, healthcare with Indian hospitals, and the justice system, among others, that have influenced the health status of our communities. The health system has also had a history um, of harming First Nations and Métis within those Indian hospitals, which were in operation across the country from 1930 to about the 80s. After that time, they were closed or converted and integrated into provincial or territorial systems. Indian hospitals were chronically understaffed and often the place where doctors and nurses who couldn't get work elsewhere would go. There's a history of experimental treatments that were conducted on children and adults who attended the hospitals without informed consent. And so this experience in Indian hospitals is part of what has created such a mistrust of our current system. Knowledge of Indian hospitals may not be familiar to many of you and, and isn't, I find, to a lot of health practitioners, but it is common knowledge within our communities and many still carry firsthand experience. We'll go to the next slide. More recently, the death of Joyce Eshaquan helped to raise awareness and propel all levels of government to start talking about anti-Indigenous racism in our healthcare system. Joyce was a 37-year-old woman, a wife and a mother, and who live streamed the blatant racist remarks directed at her from emergency room staff in a Quebec hospital. The coroner's report indicated that she did not receive the appropriate clinical care given her presenting symptoms. And this was the first investigation into the death of a First Nations Inuit or Métis patient that stated racism as a factor in their death. Brian Sinclair, if you're familiar with his experience, also died in an emergency room um, in Winnipeg, Manitoba. Um, but that report did not indicate that racism played a factor in his death that's still contested today. So the point is that racism is not simply a terrible experience, but it is also a patient safety issue. And unfortunately, these are not isolated incidents. We've been hearing about these experiences in our communities since the beginning of the colonial approach to healthcare. They've often been dismissed as standalone incidents and as patient experience concerns instead of a patient safety issue. There are now multiple reports from different regions across the country highlighting how significant a problem anti-Indigenous racism is in our healthcare system. Joyce's actions in response to the racism she was facing gave others a window into these experiences. And I believe that she's the reason why we're finally talking about confronting the problem of racism in the health system. I'm very grateful to her. Next slide. So as we take action to address racism, we're creating the opportunity for cultural safety. This definition that you see on the screen here was developed by the First Nations Health Authority. They're a First Nations, um, independent First Nations Health Authority providing uh, patient care to uh, First Nations in BC. The key to understanding safety is that it's an outcome and it's defined by the person receiving care. So it's not something that you, a skill that you say you have or something that you can say that you're doing. Let me go to the next slide. 
But the skills that you can develop um, to help you deliver care in a safe way are the other terms that I mentioned previously that often are confused and used interchangeably with cultural safety. So you begin at cultural awareness, where you acknowledge the difference that, that there are differences that, that play a role um, in how people see the world. Then you move into cultural safety. That's the next step where you develop an understanding that people see the world from a different lens, and this might result in small changes in your practice with others. Cultural competency is about being able to do the right thing successfully, given someone's uh, experience. And you might behave in a way that respects or honors the beliefs of others. And finally, we move into cultural humility. And this is really the level we need to achieve in order to really create safety. It is only with humility that you can really develop trust with First Nations, Inuit, and Métis clients as part of your therapeutic relationship with them. Cultural humility is a process of self-reflection, understand personal and systemic biases, and to develop and maintain uh, respectful processes and relationships based on mutual trust. It involves humbly acknowledging oneself as a learner when it comes to understanding another's experience. It is the self-reflection in cultural humility that differentiates it from other stages and is something that both Anne, um, a skill that Anne and Brady have referenced as well. So striving towards providing culturally safe care doesn't require you to become an expert in specific cultures of your clients, but it does require you to learn about the history of colonization and the impact on First Nations, Inuit and Métis communities. This is the history of Canada. And as described in the definition of cultural safety, it requires you to understand the power imbalances in these relationships of your own privilege and how that plays out in healthcare interactions. It requires you to self-reflect, identify your own biases and the systems of oppression that prevent people from achieving wellness. Go to the next slide. And so you might be asking yourself, well, what now? How do I get started? Or how do, do I continue to learn and grow on this journey? So I'm gonna come back to an idea that Brady shared as well. And that's about um, working on developing a trauma-informed practice. So it's an approach to care that really helps you on that journey. Most of us as healthcare providers have been trained in a biomedical or even a biopsychosocial model that's very much deficit-based. When interacting with a client, we focus on what is wrong with them? And we become very good at articulating a list of impairments that need fixing. A trauma-informed approach shifts instead to a strengths-based perspective, which asks, what has happened to you? This allows you to better understand the person's experience, develop a, a relationship with them, and ultimately allow you to co-design a plan that meets their needs. It allows you to understand how the broader uh, systems are at play and impacting the client. It's an approach that might be familiar to some of you who are social workers or who have worked in mental health and addictions, uh, but this is an approach that's not something you need to turn on or off depending on who you're working with. Using this approach with all your clients will allow everyone to experience better care. And just as I finish, I just wanted to um, uh, highlight and we'll share the links afterwards is that there are tools at your disposal. We'll, we'll share those things with you, um, but also that your provincial government has two pieces of work that might be helpful um, for you to know about as you start to think about an equity approach. So they have um, articulated some activities related to truth and reconciliation, as well as um, they've published a report on racism within the province and some recommendations to address it using, uh, and there's specific health sector recommendations there as well. So we'll share that with you afterwards. Thank you. Thank you so much, Katie and Anne and Brady for sharing this with us today. Um, I think that um, it definitely, leaves us with a lot to reflect on and think about, which is something that um, has been a call in each one of your presentations was on reflection as almost a first step of um, what we can what we can do and how can we move forward in this. Um, so we have a bit of time um, for questions, comments, and reflections. Um, I like what's on the screen right now as a way to ground us and in, in kind of thinking about what we've heard today and, and how we're feeling as a result of this. Um, 
and uh, I, as an aside to this, I did want to acknowledge for, you know, all of our nursing home without walls sites listening now that this has taken a very different approach, I think, to some of our other webinars in the sense that um, these are really big picture, higher level concepts that sort of inform how we do our day-to-day -day tasks. This hasn't been a webinar on advertising your services or, you know, how to work through transportation, um, you know, uh, organization in your sites, but this has been some big picture, big picture concepts. So um, I think this, this reflection task and the ability to think about what you've heard today and discuss it with coaches will probably help to unpack and untangle a few things. Um, so I'm going to keep a, a watch out on the chat to see if there's any um, questions that come through. I also um, would say that I know that a lot of sites are considering um, cultural safety, um, safety in the homes and the older adults that you're working with, um, equity in the work that you're delivering. So if there are any examples of how you've adjusted or adapted or deliver your programming as it relates to these concepts, please share that as well, because I think it would be helpful to some other sites um, to hear that. So we're going to pause and see if anyone has any reflections or questions or comments. Maybe as a little exercise, I'd like to ask um, if you feel comfortable to put a word into the chat in terms of how you're feeling um, as a result of, of our conversations today. And um, the safe place, if you feel comfortable doing so, you could. Um, it doesn't all have to be rosy, um, you know, positive <laughs> ways of, of feeling. Um, so, uh, yeah, feel free to share if you would like about how this is sitting with you and how you can kind of relate what you've heard today to um, the work that you're doing. I see Patricia sharing, she could see how this comes up in times of family dynamics and how to better support those dynamics and guide to safer care for sure. gossip equals harm. Absolutely. Right? The words that you're saying and how you're saying and who you're saying them to, 100%. Maybe I'll just share if it's okay, Stephanie. Um, I think this piece about how we are feeling is so important to learning and unlearning and then relearning. Um, it's really about, I from my perspective, it is that embodied part of how we change or shift those habits of mind I had alluded to near the end of the slides I was speaking to. And so whether it's sharing it in the chat or just really doing that gut check with yourself, um, I think it's really, it's really important. And I know it's been helpful for me as I've been along my own journey of learning related to equity, cultural safety, and, and patient safety. Thanks, Brady. And I'm looking forward to, uh, to, to revisiting some of these concepts as we go through. I know that this was a lot today, and it was a tall, tall ask of our, our colleagues to try and fit uh, cultural safety, equity, and, and safety in general into a one hour webinar. Um, we have plans in October to revisit uh, the safety piece um, for Canadian Patient Safety Week. Um, so we'll do a bit more unpacking there. Um, I know that uh, social development is also working to see if um, there could be um, some cultural safety training arranged in the next few months as well. Um, so stay tuned for that to unpack that as well. Um, just to get, you know, a bit more practical and get us talking about how these concepts can relate to the day-to-day -day work that we do in our Nursing Home Without Walls sites. 
So maybe we'll switch um, to the the poll now. Um, and as the poll is going up, I just wanted to take this opportunity to thank again, Katie, Brady, and Anne for taking the time to, to spend with us today um, to share these concepts in such a um, full of care way for us to be exposed to these ideas and to sit with them and reflect on how they make us feel. Um, if questions or comments come up, whether they're in the coaching pods or separately, um, I will would love the opportunity to connect with you three and see if we can, um, you know, answer some any any questions that do arise. Um, so thank you very much. And also would like to share that the next webinar, our last webinar of, um, I guess it's spring, summer, depending on how you're looking at it, is in June. Um, it is on um, mindful data collection. So it relates a lot to the um, to the participant trackers that you're using. It relates to adding questions or taking away questions or um, just how you're collecting information from the people that you work with and how to kind of mindfully choose how to do that and then what to do with the information that you receive back. So that will be on Monday, June 24th. And then we're going to take a, a two month break over the summer and then reconvene again in the fall with the webinar series. Um, so thank you again, everyone for spending your, uh, your lunchtime with us. And thanks again to our wonderful presenters and looking forward to seeing you all next month for our next webinar. Take care, everyone.